Hey you guys, welcome to book review number five zero, the big five zero. I am going to be reviewing Where China Meets India, Burma and the New Crossroads of Asia for this historic event. Uh, by Thant Man Yu. It's clearly a Burmese name that I am probably butchering. Well anyway, this book is split more or less into three parts. Um, oh, by the way, I'm also going to be playing some music in the background, just like in book review number 49. Well, anyway, this book is split into three parts. One is uh, Thant's uh, time spent traveling in Burma, uh, which is sort of the key focus of the book. It always comes back to that. Uh, and then time focusing on Burma's two border regions, one within China, one within um, India, those being... Yunnan in um, China, which is the border region right across from the northeast of Burma, and then to the west of Burma is the Assam region, which is part of uh, India. And obviously this being important because um, these being two border regions to the nation he's you know, investigating, but also because um, they're not countries within themselves, they're actually part of two huge emerging superpowers. Um, those being, hopefully this music isn't too distracting, uh, those being India and uh, China, respectively. China for Yunnan, India for Assam. Um, well, anyway, in the first section, uh, let me open up the map. Um, he, he starts out in what was the capital of uh, Burma in Rangoon, um, which is kind of right along the uh, Irrawaddy, I want to say river, uh, Delta. Not quite in it, but close. And uh, for the past uh, 50 years was the historical capital, or not the historical, but was the modern capital um, of Burma. Now, it recently got moved. Um, but just a couple observations from this area. He, he really says how kind of uh, not run down, but just sort of lack of economic activity there is there. One of the things that's mentioned throughout the book is um, the um, embargo that the United States and a lot of Western powers have on, I think Europe included, um, on goods and goods coming out of or manufactured in Burma and how that has essentially just stalled the economy. Um, this compared to, say, like a country like Thailand, which has gone gangbusters, or even what's mentioned in the book, uh, China, that's gone gangbusters because of um, trade and interaction with. Uh, with the West, um, and to a degree like India. Um, and one of the things that he uh, actually mentions is now that India and China have gained some foothold in the economic cloud of the world, how they're, particularly China, really, is starting to enter, um, hmm, let me stand up here, is starting to enter Burma uh, economically themselves and kind of, uh, now that they've got some clout, really pushing into Burma to the point where it's there's parts in the uh, northern part of Burma that are almost unrecognizable from 20 years ago. Well, anyway, that leads us into the next section of the Burma area, which is uh, Negapa... N-A-Y-P-Y-I-T-A-W. Okay, so I did not pronounce that right, but that's the modern capital of Burma. And even though Burma is a very impoverished state, I mean, it's not the worst, but it's one of the worst in um, all of Asia. Let's see if we can get this song going. Okay, we'll just go with this one. Um, even though it's one of the most impoverished in all of Asia. Sorry, you guys, I'm going to have to turn this down a little bit. Um, it's, uh, and it's not like Africa. Um, hmm. 
Oh, it, it's still dedicated resources to this capital. Uh, it actually did, uh, there's a famous pagoda in uh, Rangoon, yeah, in Rangoon, the capital from 50 years ago that um, is, or for, for the last 50 years until like modern times, un until like the last five years. So like, okay, I think the capital moved in like, like 2007 or something, and it was the um, post-World War II capital. So if that makes sense, that makes it a lot easier. Um, but there's this famous um, pagoda there, and despite the um, squeeze in the Burmese state, there's still uh, they decided to make an almost exact uh, recreation of this within their new capital, which prior to 10 years ago, um, when they started building it, was just a rice field in the middle of nowhere. So anyway, he knows how everything is new there. It's very bureaucratic, but he also questions like just the viability of um, sort of this isolated, um, not not wealthy capital, but definitely not impoverished capital. If the finances of Burma in the long run um, can't be turned around, uh, now from what source they'll be turned around is a question for the rest of the book. So next he moves up to Mandalay, which is um, the old, old historical capital and is still a very large city of about a million people. Um, and what he kind of observes here is two things. One, Mandalay is much less um, sort of like, feels like a police state or just sort of like bureaucratically controlled um, than Rangoon or the modern capital, which I won't try to pronounce again. Um, you know, people are allowed to wear clothing that you might not in other areas. Um, there's religious views that are expressed there that aren't necessarily expressed in the other areas. It's not so much political, but just sort of like socio, you know, cultural, I guess. Um, but the other thing he observes is how strongly the Chinese influence is really coming in on Mandalay. And this is the area of the country where, you know, there is this uh, train line no, uh, they don't mention what it is. Dang. Uh, there's this train line that's going from Yunnan to uh, through, which is, you know, which can connect to other parts of China and uh, whatever, uh, all the way to through the central part of Burma or Myanmar, which is actually its modern name. Burma is the old name. Um, Okay, real, real quick side note. Uh, Burma are the people who are the ethnic majority within the country, but is not the historical name for the country. And so calling the country Burma, most people don't know this, calling the country Burma is like calling, um, I don't know, calling China Han, like Han land. And so they changed it to Myanmar to be a little bit more accurate to what the land was instead of just what the majority of people were and giving some ethnic minorities within the country some say so, if you will. Um, I don't know. I guess it would be call it like calling um, the United States your land too or something. I don't know <laughs> what exactly the equivalent would be in the United States. Um, but anyway, yeah, there's this uh, big uh, train line, and uh, Mandalay is one of the key stopover points. Um, and so the, oh man, this is starting to get loud. The Chinese are, uh, the Chinese, uh, obviously with the building of this rail line, oh, I guess I should say why the rail line's being built. Really, one of the key reasons why it's being built is because it gives China, which uh, its only um, maritime access is to the Pacific, and therefore to get to the Indian Ocean, and more specifically, the oil in the Middle East has to go around the Straits of Malacca, around Singapore, which is um, safe, but just a longer trip, and um, just kind of fraught with whatever the political tensions are in Malaysia and Singapore and Indonesia at that time period. And so the Chinese kind of to hedge their bets, not to say that Myanmar is exactly the most stable, but to hedge their bets a little bit, built this rail and oil pipeline that extends from the Yunnan in sort of south central China uh, down into uh, the uh, Burma to reach the coastline of the Indian Ocean. 
Uh, but you know, the effects that are felt in like Myanmar, um, specifically, there's like a there was a vacuum because of all these uh, economic regulations that or economic uh, sanctions that were going on uh, against Myanmar from the West. So in this vacuum, really, the Chinese have moved in, not really so much into like a particularly military stance, though there actually there are occasionally border skirmishes between the two countries, um, but more just in a purely economic sense. You know, there's uh, cell phone companies that only advertise to uh, Chinese clientele within Myanmar, or within uh, Mandalay, within all of Myanmar, but specifically he mentioned within Mandalay. Um, and, you know, just a lot more business economic opportunity for Chinese, almost to the point that he fears that within the next however many years that the Burmese will become, an, if not a uh, just pure population minority, like an economic minority or an economic second class within their own country. It's quite a crazy thing to think about. Well, anyway, he moves up next into, man, it's really hard to see in this book, uh, into Issapah, Maimi, Maimi and Issapah, which are two cities. Uh, kind of some of the quite some of the things that he mentions in this region are um, kind of the historical British influence. Uh, you know, the British. He he kind of took the uh, train line that's being built or the equivalent road nearby. Um, and is going up into the mountains. And one of the things about the British is that they always like to rule um, from the mountains in India and Myanmar and whatever, just because of the coolness of the climate. And so he kind of mentions uh, this historic hotel, which I thought that would be pretty cool to live in. It was, you know, kind of an old um, uh, teak. I think teak was the uh, wood that was used, but kind of old colonial grandeur or whatever that was now fading, but um, people kept up as a hotel. Um, he also mentions the uh, Burma Road, which was kind of the first attempt to make this connection between China and uh, the Indian Ocean. Now that being more drawn by war politics of World War II, uh, not to get too much into this, but when the Chinese invaded, or when the Japanese, excuse me, uh, invaded China as part of uh, World War II, they controlled the entire coastline. And so Chiang Kai-shek, who was the leader of the uh, Chinese nationalists, essentially the Chinese country that was still left, uh, was pushed into the interior and had no access to the ocean. And so therefore the only way to get um, uh, supplies, which were you know, obviously more urgent at that point than just pure economic supplies, it was military supplies, um, to his troops was an overland route, which eventually became the Burma Road, which at times was open, at times not. Um, they also flew car big cargo planes. And actually, my great uncle flew one of those planes. Uh, called, it's called going over the hump, over the Himalayas, um, into Yunnan and the province above it, Sichuan, um, during the war effort to resupply Shang or Chiang Kai Shek's uh, troops to fight against the Japanese. Now, of course, we all know what happened, and that it eventually got uh, the Japanese eventually got pushed out and. I don't know what happened during the intermediary years of the nationalists, but once the communists took over, essentially their relation with Burma and Burma's relation with China got bad to the point that the road is now just completely gone, uh, grown over, not maintained. Um, you know, both states became very isolated for a time. Um, and so this, the, the new rail that's being built is sort of the first attempt in, um, since World War II. Uh, um, for such economic progress to uh, occur. And I think my face is looking a little washed out in this. It's all right there. Okay, so eventually he moves into the Yunnan. Um, and he talks about a whole range of things. Kind of the, one of the things that I really liked was um, he talked about uh, how he had been in the Yunnan previously uh, in, in a backpacking voyage, which I really get excited about because that's what I'm really interested in about Asia. Um, and about the modern times and about how the backpackers are still there. But what's really changed is a slight increase in the number of Western backpackers. But what's really changed is the huge number of overall Chinese tourists in the Yunnan province. The, the Yunnan province is essentially looked at as like, I don't know, 
the Colorado or maybe even like the California, if not the economic activity, the outdoor activity uh, of China that people go to to enjoy uh, to enjoy themselves. Where are we at? Here we can do this one. I think. Sorry, you guys. I'm changing up videos here, and it's kind of being a pain for me. Yes, we want Blank and Jones and Ambient. Play it. Okay, well, we can just do without music for a while. Um, but anyway, uh, yeah, so he has this uh, kind of dualistic experience between the two. Hmm. He has this kind of dualistic experience between the two. Sorry, guys, this is really just not working. Okay. Uh, <laughs> that was about a waste of a minute. Um, and he kind of sees some of the pollution and just what, what really kind of the emphasis that he gives in the Yunnan section is the overall prosperity and economic opportunity. Now, a lot of it is not directly from the uh, people of Yunnan province, but what it is is because China is a centrally controlled state, they said, here, economics, and it's, you know, skyrocketed because of tourism and um, just because of the focus that the central government has put on the region. Now, we're still talking relatively poor compared to the east coast of China, which, of course, is relatively poor compared to the United States. But what you really saw was kind of a vitality there. Um, yeah, I don't know how much I really have to say about that. You know, he talks about, like, the border region. Oh, yeah, I guess, you know, he talks about really kind of this is more on the um, uh, Myanmar side of the border, but kind of the drug activity that goes on and how much of it can actually actually takes place within Yunnan. Now, we're not talking about just users, but what we're talking about is, like, cultivation within Myanmar and the drug trafficking trade that takes place in the rest of the, uh, that, or that might travel through China on its way to wherever it's going in the world. Um, specifically, poppies being grown for the heroin trade um, there. Uh, yeah, here we go. Um, another thing that he talks about is there's an interesting kind of uh, gambling center <laughs> that's right across the border in, from China in Burma, so uh, a lot of people in China, if China uh, gambling is illegal in China, particularly casino gambling. And most people go to Macau, which is a special economic region within China to go gambling that I've actually been to. Um, but if you want a little bit more sleazier gambling, or a little bit more incredulous gambling, a lot of people will cross the border in Myanmar to an area that actually isn't controlled by the central government, but is controlled by some warlord, like some little fiefdom. Uh, and of all things, they set up a gambling center there to try to increase his own funds so he can continue in his war effort. Uh, it should be mentioned that within Myanmar, there's all sorts of um, factions, particularly in the hills. The, the Shan, um, that's the main one that comes to mind. Uh, the Aachen, yeah, that's a big one. And he actually mentions that... Uh, there's a small tribe in the far north of Myanmar that's right across the border from Yunnan. That's the only pygmy <laughs> uh, human population. Yeah, those people actually exist. Uh, left on mainland China, the, or mainland Asia. The only pygmy human population other than that, I think in the world, but definitely within Asia, is in Indonesia. Um, so yeah, economic opportunity, economic vitality. Maybe a little certain crassness of um, political sense, but then the Chinese, this is in Yunnan, but then the Chinese have never really been, you know, associated with political correctness. Um, i trying to remember some of the other stuff. I don't know. I just remember, like, the in the Yunnan, he was just very sort of on the ground um, or whatever. Um, okay, this is starting to ramble. So let's just go ahead and move on. I, I really wish there was more to say because it was a great section, but I can't remember <laughs> that much more. So check it out, you guys. 
Uh, then the next section he moves on is to Assam uh, in India, and he kind of contrasts this with uh, the Yunnan and then and its lack of uh, economic vitality. You know, one thing about the Yunnan is because China has a very strong centralist government. Um, really all the civil wars have been in. The only civil, the only civil unrest that really exists from an economic minority, or the, well, there's still civil unrest, but the ability to express that in violent terms just doesn't exist in China outside of maybe like the far uh, west, like the Uyghur autonomous province. Um, but, and traditionally the Yunnan was not a Han, um, being the primary ethnic group, was not a Han minority or majority state, it was a very ethnic minority state. And that's actually something he mentions about Yunnan, is uh, the history of all these ethnic minorities that have been oppressed over time. Um, but right now, it's kind of being celebrated for economic opportunity and tourism, you know, along with all these mountains and scenic beauty that they have there. Um, so things are stable enough that economics can prosper and there can be trade between Myanmar and Yunnan, as is currently going on. Um, but in the Assam region, India doesn't have nearly as strong as central control on the state. So there's kind of this ongoing low-level civil war within the Assam region, which actually uh, is a good contrast to the book that I reviewed about the Kashmiri region. Now, they're two completely different circumstances, but they're both kind of like fringe regions of India, which India, because their central government, um, well, they, they do have strong policies, but like for some reason they just can't get it straight, maybe because they're just not as vindictive as the Chinese are um, in dealing with their ethnic minorities, that there are still these sort of low-level civil wars going on. Now, if you know anything about low-level civil war or any war whatsoever, and that it ruins economic activity, and particularly in the fickle industry of tourism, which uh, a lot of people see as a long-term um, viable option for Assam. Assam being like the cloud forests, uh, highland region, tea growing region, um, scenic region, you know, the, um, what is it? The Bamaputra, yeah, I'm make sure I said that right. The Bamaputra River, uh, runs through the region and it's a very sort of um, mellow, well it's a big river but just kind of, and it's not mellow when it comes out of the mountains, it's roaring, 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 but then once you reach the flood plains, it's a uh, very scenic river that's in the place. I don't know, I can only describe the scenery of Assam so much, but there is potential there. But he mentions that how there's all these civil wars going on. And not just like one ethnic group, but like six or seven ethnic groups that are these tiny, tiny fractions are all trying to fight the Indian government, which is a losing cause, but uh, you know, it's a cause that maybe, maybe depending on your perspective, depending on their perspective, uh, might be worth taking up because of you know what's going on there. Um, yeah, and he talks about how you know the primary industry a lot in a lot of these border regions is gun running, which is obviously very different from the um, sort of um, very cheap but industry-driven stuff that's going on or trade stuff that's going on between China and Myanmar. Obviously, you can't build an build an economy on guns, or maybe you can if you live in the United States. Uh, but anyway, I feel like uh, this review is getting a little long and I haven't done it justice, I've bobbled around a whole lot, but really this is a comparable book to say like, um, uh, I don't know, it's a, maybe a country driving by, or a China Roads, or country driving, uh, in that he really explores Myanmar and the regions around Myanmar, gets into the history, gets into some depth, talks about um, the problems. One thing I didn't mention was the problems of the regime itself, you know, how they have kind of been dicks over the era, not only to the minorities within their state, but kind of how they've been crony and self-enriching instead of really focusing on what's best for the state. Um, yeah, so I did a terrible review, but this is a fantastic book. Uh, if anyone is still watching, um, probably in the top 10% of books that I've reviewed, or that I've read, uh, and maybe top 20% of books that I've reviewed while uh, doing these book series. So um, 
bad number 50 review, but uh, go check it out where China meets India. It's really quite good.